In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. I'm happy to be with you for the first time for me, actually, in uh, St. Cyril, uh, the sixth church here in South Jacksonville. And I pray that in a very short time, you will have your own permanent church and also a regular service through uh, the grace of God. Uh, our Bible study tonight from Psalm 10. So I want all of you to have Psalm 10 ready with you, either if you have the Bible or on, on your phone. So we can actually uh, follow together. Uh, you know, when I, I, I explain in the verse, you will be able to follow with me. First, I like to give introduction to Psalm 10. Uh, most of the Psalms have title, but this Psalm has no title of its own. Uh, and because it shares some themes of Psalm 9, many scholars thought that originally Psalm 10 and Psalm 9 was one Psalm. And Psalm 10 is considered the second part or second half of Psalm 9. Some supported this idea and others said no. It is uh, a Psalm that stands on its own because Psalm 9 is a Psalm of victory. Psalm 10 actually is a Psalm of lamentation at the apparent prosperity of the wicked. Uh, and the main theme of this psalm is the oppression and the persecution of the wicked to the righteous. Psalm 9 speaks about external enemies, but Psalm 10 speaks about internal enemies, enemies from within the community, from within the believers who oppress the poor, the orphan, and who ignore God's judgment. So, if we want actually to give a title to this psalm, we will call it the cry of the oppressed. The cry of the oppressed. And this psalm actually concentrates on the heart. It mentioned in verse 6, 11, and 13, and declares clearly that the heart of the wicked is proud. The heart of the wicked is proud. But the heart of the humble is the dwelling place of God. So pride dwells in the heart of the wicked, but God dwells in the heart of the humble. In fact, the proud heart has no place for Christ. Because who dwells in the heart of the proud and in the heart of the wicked? Satan. It is the throne of Satan. That's why as we're going to read in verse 11, the wicked has said in his heart, God has forgotten. He hides his face. He will never see. So, while the pure and righteous see God as their Savior, the wicked believes that God has forgotten his wickedness and God will not judge him or examine him. That's why they multiply their iniquities and increase their evil. So, when this psalm was written, as I told you, we don't know actually, because there is no title, but some scholars said this psalm was composed in general terms and not for a special historical event. It represents the cry of the righteous for help 
especially during time of persecution or time of hardship. This psalm is very good to pray it while you are persecuted or when you suffer tribulation, whenever or wherever it is. Also, this psalm can be prophetic about the suffering of the Church of Christ through all the years and mainly during the time of the Antichrist. Also, this psalm tells us about the destiny of the wicked enemies. Some scholars said, no, there is a special historical event for this psalm. They said David composed this psalm after he was persecuted by King Saul. Others said this psalm was composed after the invasion of Canaan by the Philistines. Some said this psalm was composed during the time of Nehemiah when Sanballat and other enemies during the Babylonian captivity they opposed Nehemiah and others said it was composed during the time of Maccabees when the, the Jews suffered uh, persecution under Antiochus Epiphanes. Psalm 9 and 10 together express the groaning of the church under tribulation of the expected Antichrist or under atheism, immorality, as these days we can see how atheism and immorality are increasing. We can actually divide this psalm into three sections. The first verse, the cry of the oppressed, from 2 to 11, the characteristic of the wicked and oppressors, <clears throat> from 12 to 18, God helps the oppressed. So let's start from verse 1. <clears throat> Why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide in times of trouble? And many of us during the time of trouble, we feel that God is very far from us, as if he doesn't listen to us as if he hides his face from us in the time in which actually we need him very, very much. So the psalmist here is asking why God is afar off? Uh, as, if, as if God is unconcerned about the humiliation given to his name and the harms that are done to us, his children. As if the psalmist is saying, why after you delivered your people from the foreign enemies, from the external enemies, why you don't interfere to protect your people from their internal enemies, from the domestic oppressors? Like during the time of Diocletian, the persecution came from outside. But after the division of the church uh, in the 5th century, the persecution came from Christian to Christian. So the psalmist asked a question, and this question is well known to those who follow God. Why God sometimes seems to be afar off so there is here an anxiety about the apparent inactivity of God. For many of the oppressed in their pain, they want to see the judgment of God. For example, when the martyrs of Libya or the martyrs of Knesset Qaddisin in Alexandria or the martyrs of Tanta, or, or many, many martyrs, El Kosh, before this, we want to see the immediate judgment of God upon the wicked. That's why at that time and all, 
always in the time of persecution, we say, why? Why? And here David, or the psalmist, in the first verse, asked why twice. Why here it's a why of lamentation? Uh, it is a signal of feeling frustrated or forsaken by God. So the word why here reflect the impatient and the despair of the psalmist. Why you are forsaking us? Definitely if God withdrew his face from us at any moment, this will be troubling. But particularly in the time of trouble, it is very, very troubling to the believer. We cannot actually bear when God stand afar off from us, especially during the time of trouble. The believer cannot bear when God withdrew his gracious presence from them and defers the help and assistance that they need and does not immediately and directly come and visit us. They complain and they wonder, why do you hide in times of trouble? Psalm 10 is not the only psalm that asks this question. Actually, in Isaiah 45, verse 15, Isaiah said, Truly you are God who hide yourself, O God of Israel the Savior. So Isaiah said, you are hiding yourself during the time of trouble. Job, in, in chapter 23, verse 9, he said, when he, God, turns to the right hand, I cannot see him. I cannot see God in the time of my trouble. But of course we know that God by his essence and power is everywhere. And God is never afar off from any of his creatures. So when we say why you are disappearing, it's our perception. You know, like when you are in plane, if you look from the window, you feel like the plane is not moving while the plane actually is flying very, very fast. Sometimes we perceive God as inactive, while God actually is working uh, for our rescue and our salvation very hard. Verse 2. The wicked in his pride persecutes the poor. Let them be caught in the plots which they have devised. So now in verse 2, the psalmist explained why he was so troubled by the, an apparent, by the apparent inactivity of God. He sees that the pride of the wicked heart makes him forget God. And because he forgets God, he despises the poor and oppresses others. The wicked oppresses others either because the others oppose or dislike his wicked ways or to use them as fuel for his pride and ambition. Like nowadays, you can see people who support the immoral, uh, the immorality of our culture, persecute those who defend the truth of the scripture. Who are the poor here? The poor here are not those who are poor financially. But the poor are the good people who are commonly poor in the world things, but they, mainly they are poor in the spirit. So the wicked man is the lowliest one, the man of sin, son of perdition. 
can be also a prophecy about the Antichrist, the great persecutor of the poor saints of the church and the faithful witnesses of God. In the time of the Antichrist, when he is in power, because of the pride of his heart, he cannot endure anyone who refuses to pay reference to him or contradict his will or dissent from him. The wicked in his pride persecutes the poor. In another translation, uh, the wicked in his heart burn the poor. And this matches the Arabic translation. بالعربي في كبرياء الشرير يحترق المسكين المسكين يحترق The poor burns So what does it mean the poor burns here? Uh, can be understood either literally like when in the time of persecution they literally burned the martyrs and also in the time of the Antichrist he will burn people or torture them by flame or sword captivity. But figuratively, we can say the poor here burning with grief from within, inside their heart, when they see the pride and the prosperity and the wickedness of the man of sin. They are burning with zeal for the honor and glory of God. That's why in the second part of verse 2, he said, Let them be caught in the plots which they have devised. Uh, This was the prayer of the psalmist regarding the wicked. He prays that their deceits be turned back on them. In Psalm 9, actually, the psalms in Psalm 9 said in a confident expectation that their plots will be turned back on them. So in Psalm 9 he stated this as a certain expectation. But in Psalm 10 he said it as heartfelt prayer. In verse 3 For the wicked boasts of his heart's desire. He blesses the greedy and renounces the Lord. The wicked are boasting about what they can do in their own power. They glory in their sins. Their sins which should be their shame now they glory in their sins and especially in the satisfaction of their desire. For example, now we see people who like to normalize the homosexuality and transgenderism and abortion. They glory and they boast with every victory when, for example, the state legalizes same-sex marriage or when the state legalizes marijuana. So these people glory in the satisfaction of their desire. They consider that they won the battle. He places the greedy. While the wicked applauds themselves, they commend others that eagerly pursue and get abundance of gain. Regardless, even this abundance of gain, they got it by fraud or violence, but they consider them happy men. He blesses the greedy and renounce the Lord.
Renounce the Lord means their judgment, the judgment of the wicked, and their practice are contrary to God. So they not only persecute the poor, but also they sin against God by renouncing God. When, for example, we tell them uh, abortion is sin, the Bible said so, don't murder. Homosexuality is sin, the Bible said so. And they want to normalize these things, actually they are renouncing God. They are renouncing God and glory in renouncing God. St. John Chrysostom said, the psalmist laments that evil has so prevailed as to be something to be proud of and is spoken openly about. It is shameless and has others to applaud it. So, not only they are living in sin, but they are proud of their sin. Anyone who actually renounced God is sinful. But yet the psalmist here puts the one who does not seek God and the one who does not think about God in the same category as the one who renounced God. So renouncing God, either not seeking God or not uh, thinking about God. Verse 4, the wicked in his proud countenance does not seek God, does not seek God. God is in none of his thoughts. God is in none of his thoughts. So he's putting those who don't seek God and those who renounce God in the same category. And why, why they commit such sins? Because of the pr pride, the pr as he said, his proud countenance. They know better than God. God will not tell me what's right and what's wrong. I know better. Ignoring God is an expression of our independence from God. We want to live our life independent of God. And sometimes, we feel that we are equal to God or superior to God. That is the same sin of Satan when he wanted to put his throne above the throne of God. The wicked will not seek the will of God. He will not trouble himself to inquire whether they be just or unjust, pleasing or offensive to God. Whatever they see right, they will do it. That's a pride here. That's why without any care or consideration, they rush into sin and they do whatever seem right in their own eyes. So, this verse describing a person who is caught up in himself that he does not realize a need for God. I don't need God. That's why God is in none of his thoughts. God is in none of his thoughts. They don't need God. This person thinks that he has everything under his own control. But the Bible tells us, pride goes before falling. Then in verse 5, his ways are always prospering. Your judgments are far above, out of his sight. As for all his enemies, he sneers at them. So many times we see the wicked are prospering. So in Psalm uh, 5, as if the psalmist protested to God, protested God by saying the wicked enjoy constant prosperity 
And also, your judgments are far above, out of his sight. He does not see any judgment from you. So why he would stop? He is prospering, and also you don't judge him. So why he would stop? So, the, the wicked person neither fears God nor regards man. The way which he set himself, actually, he pursue it without deviation. He pursue his wickedness, he does not regard the man, and he does not fear God. He is full of lust and unholy desires. There is nothing to hinder him. No fear, no conscience, no distrust of himself. He trusts himself very much. And also, he does not fear any opposition from men. And David told him, your judgment are far above, out of his sight. The wicked is so blinded with his sin that he cannot see the operation of God's hand. He does not understand if God is patient with him, he is patient to give him opportunity to repent. If God allowing him to prosper, this actually temporary, but there will be a time for judgment. But the wicked does not understand this. He insults God and despises men. So as if the psalmist is saying, if only God would demonstrate his judgment to the wicked man, maybe the wicked man would change his way. Uh, So this may sound as a complaint against God. And in some sense, yes. Why to make you make the wicked prosper? Why you don't judge him instantly that he may stop? But we can look at it from another perspective as complete confidence in the authority and rule of God. The psalmist recognizes that the wicked could never prosper unless God allowed it. So he is saying, while he is actually questioning why you allow him to prosper, meaning or implies that if God did not allow this, he would not prosper. So, actually in this verse, there is reference to the absolute authority of God. Then he said, as for all his enemies, he sneers at them. Who are the enemies of the wicked? The righteous. The poor saints and the righteous are looked upon by the wicked and also in the end of the days by the Antichrist as weak creatures. And all their efforts against the Antichrist and against his king, uh, kingdom, the kingdom of the Antichrist, will be treated with contempt. All his enemies, he sneers at them. He sneers at them means he blows upon them He suggests that he can cause them to fall with the breath of his mouth or strike them down with a straw or even a feather. Verse 6 He has said in his heart, the wicked, I shall not be moved. I shall never be in adversity. So, He presumes in his carnal self-control, sorry, he presumes in his carnal self-confidence that uh, he will never ever fall. He will never get punished for his wickedness. While the the righteous people have their confidence in God, the wicked man has his confidence in himself. The righteous people put their confidence in God as we read in Psalm 16 verse 8, I have set the Lord always before me 
because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. But the wicked man, because he always prospered, think that his present prosperity makes him secure for future. Because of his pres- present prosperity, then I am secure for the future. Has no anticipation of any change in the future. He supposed, as we read in Psalm 49, 11, my house will last forever. My dwelling place to, will dwell to all generations. That is their pride. Make them believe this. I shall never, as we read in verse 6, I shall not be moved. I shall never be in adversity. So the wicked man has no thought of dying. He thinks he will be exempt from calamity. So, In verse 7, the psalmist said, His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and oppression. His mouth is full of cursing, deceit and oppression. Under his tongue is trouble and iniquity. Under his tongue is trouble and iniquity. So the psalmist examined and exposed the sins of the wicked man. The wicked man who is not afraid of his enemies, who trusts himself. So, there is pride. The pride and sins are in his heart, in his mouth, and under his tongue. In his heart, in his mouth, under his tongue. He said his mouth is full of cursing. So, not only a little evil there, but his mouth is full of evil is full of oaths and blasphemies against God reviling and insult toward other men especially toward those who are good those who stand against him and hinder his wicked plan and under his tongue here actually he is hinting to the serpents the serpents have little bags of poison under their teeth so he is saying they are like the serpents. They have uh, trouble and iniquity under their, uh, their tongue. Verse 8, he sits in the lurking places of the villages. In the secret places, he murders the innocent. His eyes are secretly fixed on the helpless. So in verse 8, he continued to examine the wicked man. So, despite the bragging about his wickedness, but he is he is coward and also cruel. He sits not within the villages, but in the ways leading to the villages as robbers used to do. So in the lurking places of the villages means in the ways that lead to the villages like when the robbers uh, stay in these areas waiting, lying in wait to capture their victim. So the key to the nature of the wicked people is secrecy. They do everything in secret. Maybe they do it to avoid the shame and punishment of men. uh, And also to lie in wait for the innocent and helpless. So another characteristic of the wicked man is how he is a persecutor and oppressor, focusing his violence against the weak, the innocent and the helpless. As we read in verse 8, his eyes are secretly fixed on the helpless. His eyes secretly watch, keep a look out for the helpless. His eyes are hidden to observe the goings of those whom actually want 
to attack, to be his victims. And instead of being a helper to the poor, he takes advantage of them and deprives them of all their rights and comforts. He is not honorable enough to openly fight those who can fight him back, but he chooses his victims from the poor and helpless. So most of the dealing of the wicked man cannot take place in the open, but he hides his evil deeds. Uh, this is the land of the robbers and thieves. And we have to be prepared. We have to put on the whole armor of God for, for the wicked will be hiding and lying in wait for us, the children of God. Verse 9. He lies in wait secretly as a lion in his den. He lies in wait to catch the poor. He catches the poor when he draws him into his net. So, everywhere they will put traps for the children of God. So, verse 9 actually to illustrate the thought in, in, in verse 8. So, the allusion here to a lion or a hunter. The lion is hiding in his den, is concealed, but he looks out, and when his victim passes by, he suddenly leaps upon the victim and captures the victim. In the same way, the wicked man carefully makes his plans, conceals his purpose, and is hidden. And suddenly, he leaps upon the victim who is taken by surprise and has no power of defense or escape. St. Augustine commented on this verse, verse 9, and said, By a lion in a den, he means one in whom both violence and deceit will work. Both violence and deceit. Then St. Augustine actually classified the area of persecution into three areas. The first area, or first time, first era, he said for the first persecution of the church was violent, like the, during the time of the Euclidean, when by torments or murders, uh, the Christian were compelled to sacrifice. Then the second era, another persecution was crafty, which is now conducted by the heretics of any kind and false brethren, like the false teachers, how they deceive the people, heretics, how they deceive the people. The third era, then, which there is nothing more brilliant for is during the time of the Antichrist, it will be both violent and crafty in the same time. So the times of the Antichrist, it will be violence and crafty together. Verse 10, so he crouches, he lies low, that the helpless may fall by his strength. So the Psalms continue the same metaphor. The lion, the lion here, the wicked, squats down and gather himself together that he may make the greater leap to catch his uh, victim. He did it all delighting in the thought that God doesn't see him or he forgot about him. That's what he said in verse 11. He has said in his heart, God has forgotten. He, God, hides his faith. He, God, will never see. So, The wicked, why he does all of this? Because he doesn't believe in God. That's what the atheists are doing. He's, they say, God has forgotten. God will never see our wickedness against the poor 
and the helpers. So here the wicked not only sin against mankind and against the poor and helpless, but also they commit blasphemy against God. And there is difference between the pain in the believer's heart when it seems to him that God has forgotten him and the sinner who actually vainly hopes and takes false comfort in the idea that God has forgotten. So in verse 1 we read about the pain of the righteous when it seems to him that God has forgotten him. And in verse 11 we see how uh, the wicked rejoices that God has forgotten, God will not see, God will not judge him. After he explained the characteristic of the wicked, from verse 12 to the end of the psalm, the, the psalmist speak about how God helps the oppressed. And there is a, a cry of victory here. Verse 12, Arise, O Lord. Many times we hear it in the divine liturgy. Arise, O Lord. O God, lift up your hand. Do not forget the humble. So at this point in Psalm 12, the psalmist passes from verse 12, the psalmist passes from description to supplication. After he describes the wicked, now he is making his supplication. From verse 2 to 11, he described the conduct, the attitude, and the very deepest thoughts of the wicked. Now, from verse 12, he speaks to God. He's simply calling upon God to take an action. He calls on God to remember those who are oppressed and those who are wronged by the wicked. As if he is saying, Lord, this wicked man finds comfort in the idea that you will not do anything against him. So arise, O God, lift up your hand, let thy power be made manifest. So this verse is the constant cry of the church, arise, O Lord. And the the church will never cease until the Lord shall come in his glory to judge all his opponents. Verse 13, why do the wicked renounce God? He has said in his heart, you will not require an account. So the psalmist here actually is is as if he is saying to God, do you know why the wicked renounced you? Why the wicked uh, does not care about your existence? They deny your existence? Because in their heart, they said, God will not require an account. So as if the psalm say, God, please do something that they know you exist instead of denying your existence. God's long suffering, instead of leading the wicked to repentance, unfortunately, his long suffering leads the wicked to harden his heart more and more. Uh, In verse uh, 14, but you have seen, the psalmist is saying to God, you have seen, for you observe the trouble and grief to repay it by your hand. The helpless commits himself to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. So, uh, the psalmist recognizes that God indeed has seen the oppression of the wicked. And God cares about the trouble and the grief of the poor and the helpless. Here, the psalmist has confidence in God's judgment. His faith actually triumphs because his faith rests on the unchanging character of God. 
God will never change. And God, because he, he is immutable, unchangeable, he will never cease to observe all what goes on earth, especially the oppression of the wicked, uh, the oppression of the wicked to the needy and to the helpless and to the righteous. And the psalmist expresses his confidence that God will repay the wicked for their sins. And he is reminding God that the helpless commit himself to you. They give themselves up entirely into your hands. They appeal their case to you, O God. So, arise, O Lord, lift up your hand. The righteous submitted their will to your power. They rest assured that you will direct all things for the best. As we read in Romans 8, all things work out together for good for those who love God. So God will indeed answer the helpless. And God is the helper of the fatherless. Verse 15. Break the arm of the wicked and the evil man. Break the arm means break their power. Seek out his wickedness until you find none. Until you find none wicked on earth. Break their strength, the instrument of their violence and cruelty. Deprive them of all power to do harm until it is all punished until there has been a full recompense, until there is a time when the wicked will be powerless to do harm and no wickedness at all in the world. That is the time of the second coming of Christ. Verse 16, The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations have perished out of his land. So David start, or the psalmist started this psalm with despair in the time of trouble. Now he concludes the psalm as usual with calm confidence in the reign of God as eternal king. He ended this psalm with a song, a song of thanksgiving to the great and everlasting God. God, as if he is saying, God, you granted the desire of the humble and the oppressed people. You defended the fatherless. You punished the nations who trampled upon the poor and afflicted your children. God will reign forever and ever. Therefore, your people is never hopeless. We see that you live and reign forever and ever to help us, your children. Therefore, you will help us in your time sooner or later, according to your economy. The nations have perished out of his land, the land of God. How? Here the psalmist, remembering the past victories of God, Again, it's the cruel enemies of his people. This actually gives him greater confidence regarding the present and the future that God actually will remove his enemies from the land. The enemies will be completely destroyed. Verse 17. Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. You will prepare their heart. You will cause your ear to hear. So, here with a complete confidence, you have heard the desire of the humble. Uh, he continues to express the confidence in God. God will not abandon the poor and the needy, but help and bless them. You have heard. God has not permitted uh, his followers to pray in vain. Our prayers will be heard. Our prayers that God avenge his people will not be in vain. You have heard the desire of the humble. Here 
What is the desire of the humble in contrast to the desire of the wicked? The desire of the wicked to prevail in his prosperity, violence, but the desire of the humble that God will rescue them. So the desire of the wicked will end in disappointment, even if temporarily they prospered. But the desire of the humble will be actualized even if it happened after some time. He said, you will prepare their heart. This is a wonderful verse. The psalmist reminds us that there is a spiritual preparation of the heart in order to endure the affliction of the wicked. And this spiritual preparation is the greatest gift of God to us. It is answer to our prayer and it is a sign of God's blessing. Verse 17 ended by, you will cause your ear to hear. You will cause your ear to hear. God has an ear to hear the prayer of his people. His ears are open to the cries of the righteous one. He will give an answer in his own time and in his own way according to his own economy. Then he concluded with verse 18, to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed, that the man of the earth, the wicked, may oppress no more. So, these words verse 18 express the faith of the psalmist in God being a God hearing and answering our prayer especially the prayer of the poor and the helpless the psalms said in verse 18 he is so sure of God's justice that it will be applied to the wicked God will put an end to the rage of the persecutors because the persecutors he called them man of earth man out of earth therefore actually their cruel and wicked ways are weak and will go into earth again will be vanished (coughs) as if he is saying why should we be afraid from the anger of the oppressor who are just men of earth they will die the son of man will be made like a grass they are men of earth they will vanish they will end he who protect us is the lord of heaven and he who persecute us is man of earth we should not be afraid because our protector is the lord of heaven and our persecutor is the man of earth so what's beautiful about this psalm this psalm began with a sense of despair in time of trouble why you are far off but end with calm confidence in god's justice and victory this concludes actually psalm 10 glory be to god forever and ever amen